what a beautiful song to sing. Uh, we hope that all of us are here today because we want to and do trust in Jesus. Uh, your life is so much better if you are trusting in Jesus. There are so many things that this world tries to entice you with, that the devil tries to use to lead you down the wrong path in this life. And I assure you that if you will let Jesus work in your life, your life will be far better uh, than you can imagine. You may not be the richest person on the planet, and you may not be the most well-known, you may not be the happiest as far as what worldly happiness is, but you will have joy, you will have peace, and you will have purpose. And so I hope that you will go away from here today looking to Jesus uh, every day of your life. And as, the other, as another song says, looking to Jesus from day to day, trusting His grace all the way. I hope to look at a lesson this evening that will, this afternoon, that will help us to go away from here uh, being a little closer to God uh, than perhaps when we began today. I know you've had to listen to me twice today so far, and this has been our third lesson. I, I hope that we will continue with what I'd like to think was edification in the first hour. We've been looking at a series of lessons now on Noah. Noah is one of these people that I believe we could just, just study over and over, and there's just so many things that we can learn from the life of Noah, the obedience that he had to God, everything that, that occurred in the world that, that was pertaining to the flood, and just how impactful that event has been since uh, it was recorded in Genesis chapter 6. The world that we live in now, totally different than the world that existed then. But one thing that existed then, that still exists today, is sin. But also, one thing that exists today that still existed then is the grace of God and the chance for you and I to serve and obey God just like Noah did. This morning, or rather this afternoon, we want to look at a lesson that I've titled A Lesson About God's Authority. In our last lesson, we looked at the ark. We looked at judgment. We talked about how that God judged that pre-flood world with the flood, and, and, and in essence, wiped the world clean of all the wickedness and all the sin that existed. The only people that survived were those that were in the ark. Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. Eight people were saved. The Hebrew writer tells us that this happened in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 because Noah, being warned of God, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his family. Now, Noah did that out of his faith in God, his obedient faith to God. And God gave Noah the instructions in Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, about what he wanted him to be. He gave him the instructions for the ark's length, the ark's width, the ark's height. He gave him instructions for the number of, of decks that were to be in the ark, the type of material to use. He gave him all these, all these aspects about the ark that enabled Noah to build exactly what God wanted him to build. And I think that is a lesson in what it means to truly respect the authority of God. And I think that when you study passages of Scripture in the New Testament, like 2 Timothy 2.15, that, that a study on Bible authority becomes more clear. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study, to show ourselves approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, in order for an individual to rightly divide the word of truth, an individual needs to understand what it means when we say Bible authority. An individual needs to have a true respect for the concept of what God's authority is and how God establishes authority in our lives if we wish to truly Divide His Word correctly. And if you're going to grow spiritually, you need to know how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. If you can rightly divide it, then you can infer that you can wrongly divide it. The warning is there. And so I believe it's important for us to think about God's authority. And there's so many different lessons that we can look at, or examples, if you will, of people, and time places, and such. But I think Noah, since we're talking about Noah, let's just use Noah. And let's talk about, in just a few minutes of our time here this morning, uh, this afternoon, whatever time it is, 
what the Bible teaches us about the authority of God. And I think when you look at Noah, what you can learn is, is you can learn that there are times when God commands his people very generally. Sometimes he'll give us a command, and he doesn't, and he doesn't give us every single detail. Sometimes, though, God is very specific. Sometimes God commands us, and he is specific about what he says. And that, and that does not leave the door open for any speculation or any deviation from what he has told us to do. Nor does the general command leave any place for deviation, per se. But what I mean is, is there should be no doubt that God says, this is what you must do. There should be no argument about, well, I don't know, because we know that God told us what to do. God can be general, and God can be specific sometimes. We'll look at, uh, at that here in a moment. Sometimes we learn God's will through examples. Sometimes God doesn't just come right out and say, Thou shalt do this or that. I know I made kind of a mistake up here on the board when I put sometimes we learn God's commands through examples. But the point is, sometimes we learn God's will. We learn what God is teaching us. We learn what God has authorized or not authorized by reading examples of others in scriptures. When we read examples where people are doing something and God is pleased with what they're doing, then that's an example. It's also a lesson in rightly dividing the word of truth as well, understanding whether or not the example applies to us today or not. Noah's Ark is an example of someone that was obedient to God, and he built an ark. But that's not an example for us to build an ark today. But if we're rightly dividing the word of truth, we can understand that. But Noah is an example of somebody who was obedient to God. Right. And there's sometimes when God tells us things in his word that maybe he doesn't give us every single tidbit uh, for us, but he gives us enough information to go on that we can infer what it is he's trying to teach us. Then there's times when God doesn't say anything. And then, God, in other words, God is silent. And the thing about the silence of God is, is that is exclusionary. When God is silent about something, then that means God is excluding that from his will, from his authority. Right. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is one passage of others that remind us of just how important Bible authority is to God. And for you who are struggling, or striving rather, to grow spiritually, it should be every one of us in here who have committed our lives to the Lord, understand that making sure that everything that you say and do is, is based upon the authority of Christ is tantamount to your spiritual growth. And is tantamount to whether or not you're being pleasing to God. So let's think about Noah and the ark. Let's think about these aspects, commands, examples, uh, necessary inference, and the silence of God in the story of Noah. God tells Noah in Genesis 6 verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Here we have God giving Noah a command, and in this verse here, there's actually a specific command from God. There's also uh, something that is a bit general from God here in Genesis chapter 6 as well. When I think about the specific command from God, the specific thing is the type of wood. God specifically tells Noah, make an ark out of gopher wood. Now, I don't know what kind of wood gopher wood was. It was gopher wood. Some Bibles will translate that cypress or, or, or maybe, uh, maybe something else or it'll say something, maybe it'll, it'll try to give you some sort of uh, subscript at the bottom of the page to tell you what it was. I don't know. I know this. The Bible specifies gopher. And as a result of that, then I know that that excluded any other kind of wood that Noah could use on the ark. Now, how does that tie into the New Testament day and age when you think about rightly dividing the word of truth? Well, let's take for instance singing. We have been singing this morning. We've been using songbooks. But you'll notice that we don't have any instruments up here in accompanying our singing. Well, the reason is the same principle that was given to Noah to build the ark out of gopher wood. God specified the type of wood. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 and Colossians 3, 16, God specifies the type of music that we are to use in New Testament worship today. He's speaking in Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
Again in Colossians 3.16 he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In both of these passages of Scripture, it talks about us worshiping God in song. It talks about how we are to teach and admonish one another. And therein lies the idea of congregational singing. We are each teaching and admonishing one another. That is why everyone is encouraged to sing Amen. and praise God in singing. But the type of music that we, that we give to God in worship is a cappella. That's what he says, singing. Just like the type of wood that Noah was to use on the ark was gopher wood. Let me ask you a question. Does specifying the type of wood to use on the ark exclude other types of wood? Did God have to say, in other words, make an ark out of gopher wood. Don't make it out of pine. Don't make it out of cedar. Don't make it out of, out of maple. Don't, and then just go down the list of every kind of tree that there was. Well, you think that would be silly, wouldn't you? If one of us, if, if you sent your child or someone to the store and you gave them money, and you said, I want you to go to Walmart and I want you to get milk and, and bread because it's going to snow, and they go to Save a Lot and they get milk and bread and they get me some strawberries and they get them some potato chips, and then they come back home and they've got all that, would you be happy? No. Why? I didn't tell you that you could go somewhere else. I told you go to Walmart. I told you to get milk and bread, or milk and, uh, yeah, milk and bread. Why did you get all these extra things? You didn't even go where I told you to go. Well, you didn't tell me not to. Well, common sense. God's given us reasoning skills. But well, God told Noah to build the ark out of gopher wood. And by saying that, God excluded all other kinds of wood. And so when God specifies singing in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, that excludes any other kind of music. That's why we don't have solos and choirs and instruments accompanying the singing. In order for us to fulfill those commands, Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16, we must sing congregationally nothing more and nothing less. Amen. And that's the concept we learn when it comes to God's commands, specific, a specific command given by God. But God also uh, gave Noah a general command here as well. God tells Noah to make an ark, uh, to, to make yourself, in Genesis 6, 14, make yourself an ark. Now, what God didn't specify was make yourself an ark using a hammer. Make yourself an ark using a screwdriver. Now, if God had done that, just like God has specified the type of wood and excluded all the kind of wood, that would have excluded all the kind of tools that Noah could have used. But God didn't say that. God said, make yourself an ark. So Noah, knowing that that was the command from God, had to, had to utilize the tools necessary to accomplish that as long as it stayed within the boundaries of what God told him to do. As long as he was building an ark and as long as he was building it according to the specifications of verses 15 and 16, along with verse 14, then he was fulfilling that command. You know, today God tells us to go. He tells us to go, ye therefore, and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, and verse 18 and 19. And in verse 20 he says, Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Make yourself an ark. Pretty general, as far as the tools is going to use. Go and teach all nations. Now God actually, Jesus actually here, being the Son of God, is, a little speci is specific in what it is he wants us to, to teach. We are, we are told the specific message is to, to teach them to observe all things that Jesus commanded. Therefore, we're not going to be going about preaching and teaching our own will or preaching and teaching something that some man has written or some man has established, but we're going to teach and preach the will of God. We're going to teach and preach what Christ has commanded, but the general command was to go. I'm so glad the Lord didn't specify how. I'm so glad the Lord didn't say, go on a camel, because I can't even ride a horse, much less a camel. I'm so glad that the Lord was general in that regard. So long as we are going, whether it be walking, running, riding a car, taking a boat, riding in a plane, so long as we are getting the message out there, we are going. We are, we are fulfilling that general command to go. 
And that's one way to rightly divide God's authority when you think about commands. Let me ask you a question. Do people today say that they're religious and say that they love God and they want to do His will, but they're doing some things that God hasn't commanded? Sure they are. Sure there's things that people do today. If we brought instruments of music into the worship, you know what? No command for that. Matter of fact, we already know that God excluded that by the command specifying to sing. What if we started tithing here? What if the elders decided, I want to, we're going to have everybody start tithing, and we're going to have to start giving a percentage uh, of our income, a percentage of, the, of our goods, and our material goods and such. No New Testament command for that. No New Testament authority for that. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 tells us what the authority is now. To give a free will offering on the first day of the week as we have been prospered of God. That's the command today. That's God's authority. What if we decided we were going to have some extra offices here? Elders and deacons aren't enough, but even though that's what the Bible specifies, we want to have somebody that's, that's geared toward the children. We're going to have ourselves a youth ministry. And then we're going to have some other kind of ministry. Then we're going to have some other kind of things. No commands for those things. You see, it's not that we harp on these things for the sake of harping about them. We harp on these things because we respect God's authority. Just like Noah respected God's authority. When God commanded, Noah acted. Uh, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Genesis 6.22. And that is an example of someone who is obedient to God. Noah sets an example. So we want to know how can I walk with God as we talked about in our first lesson on Noah. How can I be pleasing to God? How can I ensure that I am doing everything I can to prepare myself for that coming judgment day? Well, I can be like Noah. I can follow his example, his example of obedience. And there's examples in the New Testament of people who were obedient to God, especially when it comes to, say, for instance, worship. Like the reason why we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, for instance. There's an example of Christians partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week and God being pleased with that. And although the Bible never comes out and commands specifically or generally, thou shalt take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, we have an example of it. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Now upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his speech or continued his message until midnight. So here's just one example. That's the only example I want to give you of an example. That people did something pleasing to God, and they did this authoritatively. It's written to us authoritatively. That is to say, it's showing you and I that on the first day of the week, we need to come together. We need to partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to break bread, in other words. That's just another way of saying the Lord's Supper. And we need to preach. We need to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so that's why we came together here today, and that's why just a few minutes ago we partook of the Lord's Supper. But we have that example. Now, are there examples of things, uh, or rather, are there people or religious individuals and religious acts that are being conducted today that there is no command or example for? Well, sure there is. You know, you look in your New Testament in an attempt to rightly divide it, you're never going to find an example of somebody who was baptized as an outward sign of an inward grace. You might hear people say that. And people may say that very authoritatively, but they'll never be able to give you a general, specific, or an example of Scripture where that is found. There's no example of anybody being saved uh, and then being baptized as an outward sign of an inward grace. You'll never find that in the book of Acts. Matter of fact, the examples you'll find are people that heard the Word of God, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed Jesus to be the Son of God, and were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and then they raised to walk in newness of life. That's the example that we read about in the New Testament. Amen. You'll never read this kind of example. You'll never read an example about the church of the New Testament being engaged in social and recreational activities. The social, political, recreational, uh, all these different things that, that, that so many churches become involved in today, you'll never see an example of that in the New Testament. Well, what does that mean for us? Well, just like in the Old Testament, there was examples of those like Noah who, must, who had to be obedient to God and follow his will. We have to do the same today. And if we find ourselves doing things that there's no example of, then it is in violation to the authority of God. What about taking the Lord's Supper once a month, once a quarter, or once a year? You'll never read an example of that in the New Testament. Right. The only example you're going to read is upon the first day of the week. Let me ask you a question. 
In the Old Testament days, they were told to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Did every week have a Sabbath? Yes, it did. Did they keep the Sabbath every week? Yes, they did. Amen. Does every week today have a first day? Yes, it does. So how often should we partake of the Lord's Supper? Every first day of the week. Amen. Friends, that's just, a simple, that's just a simple exercise in rightly dividing the word of truth, the seeking and adhering to the authority of God. Sometimes we, we learn God's authority through inference or necessary inference, if you will. I think about Genesis 6.15. God said, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Now how does necessary inference come into play here? Here's what necessary inference is. It is an inescapable conclusion that you come to based upon the information that has been given. Now what can we necessarily infer from the command of God to make an ark that is 300 cubits long, that is 50 cubits wide, and it is uh, 30 cubits high? Well, I'll tell you something you can infer from that. I can infer that Noah had some kind of measuring tool. How is Noah going to make the ark that long and that wide and that high unless he had some way of measuring it? And so Noah would have had to have something. Noah would have had to have some kind of tool in order to do that. So although the Bible doesn't tell us that Noah went and measured out 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, the fact that the Bible tells us later on in verse 22 that Noah did everything according to God that commanded him, what can we infer? That that's exactly what Noah did. That yeah. Noah measured it out. And Noah measured it accurately. Now here's how this kind of, here's how this comes into play. In the New Testament, we're taught about baptism. Those that translated the Bible took a Greek word, baptizo, and they trans transliterated it into an English word, bap uh, baptize. The actual translation, if you were to translate baptizo into what it really means, would be immerse or immersion. So when the Bible says repent and be baptized, more accurately it would be repent and be immersed for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. Right. But those translators, in order to try to get one over on their audience and their readers, they decided, well, let's just call it, let's just make a new word. We'll call it baptize. And so now you've got sprinkling for baptism. You've got pouring for baptism. You've got immersion for baptism. You've got all these different forms. And, and we'll just call them baptism. That way we can all keep our different doctrines rather than rightly dividing the word of truth and sticking to God's commands, God's examples, and, and inferring from what the will of God says. But you know what? No matter how smart man thinks he is, he will never, never outsmart God. Amen. And the Bible will speak for itself every time. You know, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, we read about Jesus being baptized. And it tells us when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Nowhere, nowhere does the Bible tell us that Jesus went down into the water. The only thing it tells us is he went to John to be baptized of him. And then it says that when he came up from the water. Now, if you use necessary inference here, what is necessarily implied? Well, in order to come up out of the water, you have to go into the water. What does that tell us about baptism? It tells us that no matter how much man tries to hide what it truly is, the Word of God will show us every time that it is immersion. It is immersion. You must be, you, in order to be immersed or in order to be baptized, you've got to go down into the water. You cannot immerse someone. You cannot go down into the water if you're sprinkled. You cannot go down into water if water is simply poured on you. You go down into the water when you're buried in that water, when you are immersed. And so this is what necessary inference does. And let me ask you, I have other things that people might do today. And they say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't really say to do this. I know. And the Bible doesn't really give us an example of this. But come on now. God tells us to get the word out there. So couldn't we just infer that there's some things that we can do in order to get the word out there? Even though we can't really prove it in the Bible, maybe we, you know, get some kids involved in sports and recreation. Does the Bible even give us a hint that that's what God wants us to do? No. You cannot necessarily infer that the Lord wants us to be involved in sports and recreation. 
Maybe somebody says, well, you know, the Bible in Jude, verse 12, talks about the Feast of Love. So let's have us a fellowship hall. Let's have us our kitchen and our lunchroom. And that could be where we have our love feasts. You know, other than what it says in Jude, verse 12, and referring to the Feast of Love, there's not enough information there to infer what that means. There's not enough information to find a command or an example or to infer that that is authoritative for us to engage in that. Or maybe we decide that, that we just want one person to rule here, or one man pastor. Matter of fact, if you think about what it means to rightly divide the word of truth, the example in Acts 14.23 is they were named pastors or elders in every church. More than one. At least two in order to have a plurality. And so you cannot say that it's okay that we can do all these things because God has uh, just said just enough that we can infer the rest of the way. So you've, either God's commanded it, you find an example of it, or you infer it based on what's given, or that means God is silent about it. Now, Noah did everything that God told him to do. And I find that fascinating that in this one verse, it sums up exactly what is necessary to be pleasing to God. Noah did, Noah acted. He did so according to all that God commanded him. How much of it? All of it. Not some of it, and not more of it. He did all of it. All that God commanded him. So it was based upon the authority of God. It was what God told him to do. So Noah didn't do what God didn't command him to do. In other words, in other words Noah didn't say, well, you know, God was silent about some things. You think about the ark I grew up here on the board earlier today. Or all the different kinds of renditions you see of the ark. Have you ever noticed that these accurate, some of these accurate portrayals of the ark display the ark as not having a sail, or not having oars sticking out the side for some kind of propulsion. There's a reason behind that. You'll notice that the depictions of the ark depict it as a wooden ship. Well, there's a reason behind that. God told Noah to build an ark out of gopher wood. So that's why you see it made out of wood. And something God was silent about was a means of propulsion. In other words, what I'm saying is, is that just because God was silent about building a sail onto the ark didn't mean that it was okay for Noah to do it. God didn't say, bank an ark and go for it. You shall not put a sail on this ship. You shall not put oars on this ship. You shall not reinforce the hull with steel. God didn't say those things. Did he have to? No. Because when God said, make an ark out of gopher wood, steel, different types of wood, Plastic, I don't know, whatever you want to say, it excluded all those things. That's right. When God did not mention a means of propulsion, then what Noah had to do then was he had to respect that and not add anything uh, to the ark or take away from what God told him. And that's why we talk about some of the things that we mentioned here earlier, with, that we don't have commands, examples, where we can necessarily infer there's a reason why the church doesn't get involved in these things. Just to add to that list of things, the social gospel, bake sales, or having a sports team, it's because, it's because we can only do what God has told us to do. We can only do 100% of what God's told us to do, not 99%, and not 101%. We cannot go beyond, and we cannot take away. And that's what would have happened had Noah had used silence of the Scriptures as an excuse to do these things. Passages like 1 Peter 4, 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, the scriptures are the oracles of God. So God has supplied us with his oracles for us to use as we teach others using the abilities that God has given us. And when we fail to use the oracles of God to speak where God has spoken, in other words, or be silent when God is silent, if we fail to do that, the Lord isn't getting the glory. The Lord is not being given the dominion. We're going off on our own. We're doing our own thing. We are disrespecting the authority of God. But when we speak as the oracles of God, that means we're going to have to find it in this book. And if I can't find it in this book, it's not in the oracles of God. And therefore, just like Noah could not deviate, neither should we. I think about what John says in 2 John verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. 
He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. I know I've showed you this before, but I want to show it to you again. I think in 2 John 9 is something like this, like a circle, you might say. And the doctrine of Christ is in here. The doctrine of Christ is encompassed in, in, in this circle. And whoever abides in this, 100%, he's the one, or she is the one, who is of God. But when you go beyond what's on the outside of this, then you find yourself doing something that's not within the boundaries that God has given us. And if you don't do everything that's in this circle, then you find yourself doing less than what God has told you to do. Whoever abides in the doctrine of Christ is the one that has God. And it is those that fail to abide in the doctrine of Christ that does not have God. And so what he's telling us here is that we must, what we learn from the ark is we must, we must not go beyond what God has said, and we must only and fully do what God has said. Amen. Let me ask you a question. I think I asked this this morning, and I've probably asked it before, and I'll ask it again. What would have happened? What would have happened if Noah had built the ark and did not adhere to the authority of God? You know that answer already. You know that if Noah did not build the ark using the length, the width, and the height that God gave him, using the materials that God gave him, and not adding extra materials or taking away from the things that God told him, maybe shortening the length of the ark or shortening the width of the ark, or if he had deviated in any way, it would not have been the ark that God told him to build. And as a result of that, he would have sinned. What if Noah had said, well, God, you didn't say not to. You didn't say we couldn't. How many times will people use that argument? And how many times has your child tried to use that on you and you told them that that was a foolish excuse? And if that's what you would say to your child, why would it be any different with our Father in heaven? Noah, if he had used silence of the Scriptures to deviate from the authority of God, he would have been in violation of the will of God and he would have sinned. And the, and the story of the ark and those that were saved would be vastly different. We'd be talking about something totally different, a totally different ending to, this, to the story of the flood. What about today? What about you and me today? What about those of us in the Lord's church? What would happen if we did not adhere to the authority of God? If we failed to rightly divide the word of truth and we did not seek God's commands or his examples or his, necessary, or his inference, if we chose to ignore his silence, because you know one thing about the silence of God is, is it speaks volumes. Volumes. When God says you do this, it excludes everything else. There's volumes of things that that excludes. Why well, worry about what it is he didn't say? Why don't just focus on what he is saying? Why don't just simply Amen. do what God said to do? And don't worry about all that other stuff. If you just simply do what God said, like Noah, you will have done and been pleasing to God. You will have done all that God commanded, and so would you do. You walk with Him. If we as a church deviated from that, deviated from the authority of God, we find ourselves in violation of the will of God. We find ourselves sinning against God. Let me ask you a question. Final, one final question. Are you seeking God's authority in everything you do? Are you living a life that you claim to be pleasing to God with, but there's things in your life that you cannot find in the Bible? You're doing you're practicing. You're teaching. Maybe somewhere where you're worshiping. Somewhere where you've been worshiping. Are they doing things that there's no Bible authority for it? Or that you see that they have to put a, a round peg into a square hole to prove it? They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not respecting God's authority. They're not seeking His commands, His examples. They're not following what is necessarily inferred. They're doing things that are unnecessarily inferred. Matter of fact, they're unnecessarily binding things that aren't in Scripture. Are you seeking His authority? We hope you are. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you seek His authority on what you must do to be saved. In Mark chapter 16 and 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Right. What's the command? Believe and be baptized equals salvation. Maybe you've done that and you've fallen away. Come back to the Lord. There's an example in the New Testament in Acts chapter 8 of a man that sinned against God after he obeyed the command to repent and be baptized, that man being Simon the Sorcerer. He became a Christian. And then he sinned against God. He was told that your heart is in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, 
Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. That's why we encourage you as an erring child of God to repent, to seek God's forgiveness in prayer, and if necessary, we'll pray with you and for you. The authority of God is so important if we wish to grow spiritually, and if we wish to rightly divide the word of truth. Let us not forget that, and let us take it just as seriously as Noah did to the saving of himself and his family. As together we stand and say, the invitation is us. Would you live for Jesus and be always very good? Would you walk with Him within the narrow road? Would you have Him carry your burden, carry all your load? Let Him have His way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood. Heart.